So Dr. Sarah Anderson is an assistant professor in the Department of Critical Care Medicine and adjunct assistant professor with the John Doster Health Ethics Center here at the University of Alberta. She completed an NIH-funded postdoctoral research fellowship and a Master of Science in Health Sciences Research at the University of Pittsburgh and a Bioethics Fellowship at the Harvard Medical School for Bioethics. Her research focuses on ethical decision-making and critical illness and enhancing patient and family-centered care across the critical care journey. Without further ado, I pass it over to you. Thanks so much, Michael. Um, thanks for the opportunity to speak today. Um, so I'm going to be talking today about uh, the intersection between emotion, decision-making, um, capacity, and then ultimately patient autonomy. Um, ooh, let's make sure I can advance my slides. There we go. I'm going to skip over this since Michael did a wonderful job introducing me. So I'd like to start with a land acknowledgement. And I'd like to acknowledge that the Doster Center um, is situated on Treaty 6 territory, which is rooted in the experiences and histories of many Indigenous peoples, um, including the Dene, the Sioux, the Anishinaabe, the Métis, and the Inuit, among others. Um, I also want to acknowledge that I myself am from Vancouver, which is the traditional home of the Musqueam and Coast Salish people. And I've included on this slide um, a painting by one of my favorite Coast Salish artists, Lawrence Paul Uellipton, and it's called Red Man Watching White Man Trying to Fix a Hole in the Sky. And I, I find that this is kind of capturing how I'm feeling these days around my relationship to the land and reflecting on ways to be a better adv advocate and steward. Um, So um, my objectives today are to describe how emotions impact decision-making using evidence from the fields of behavioral science and psychology, um, to highlight some situations where emotion might impair decision-making capacity and thus patient autonomy, and then to explore strategies that healthcare teams can use to help enhance patient autonomy in the face of overwhelming or concretized emotions. Um, and so the inspiration for this talk, you know, came from my research interests, but also um, from a number of cases that I've experienced and struggled with um, clinically over the past several years. And so I thought I'd start with a couple example cases that are kind of aggregated from that experience. So case one is a seven-year-old woman who um, is admitted to the ICU from home. She's been admitted for five months after a bad motor vehicle collision with a severe spinal cord injury. So she's quadriplegic and unfortunately unable to come off the ventilator. And despite multiple attempts by the medical team to meet with her husband and convey the poor prognosis, um, they've been unable to come to a shared understanding. And um, you know, her husband's response sort of consistently has been, she's a fighter. Uh, she'll walk again. And then ultimately, um, uh, the team sort of found that he became less and less present and available to engage in discussions over the course of her ICU stay. Case two um, is a case that may be familiar to um, many clinicians practicing during the pandemic. So it's a 45-year-old male, unvaccinated, admitted to hospital with COVID pneumonia, um, ICU is consulted for worsening respiratory failure and the concern that the patient may ultimately require mechanical ventilation. Um, this particular patient initially refused to be tested for COVID, not believing that, um, or apparently not believing that their illness could be related to COVID, then um, wouldn't acknowledge the results of the test, which was positive and just wouldn't engage in all in conversation about intubation and life support and just sort of said, you know, I, I'm not sick. In fact, I'm well enough. I can leave today and go back to work. Um, but when asked if he was willing to accept the risk of death, um, if his heart were to stop, indicated that he wanted to live and would want CPR. So I think cases like these tend to um, provoke a strong emotional response in, in healthcare teams and clinicians. And it's not uncommon that you hear uh, statements like, well, you know, this is an unreasonable patient and family. Um, they just don't get it. 
Um, in the case of the patient with COVID, there was a lot of resistance to even admitting them to the ICU. I think it brought up a lot of emotional, um, uh, heightened emotions for people related to working during the pandemic. And ultimately, it's really tempting for medical professionals to just kind of wash their hands of um, patients in these situations and say, well, people are allowed to make poor choices. But um, ultimately, for me, these situations provoke a lot of curiosity. And I think that it's important for us to try to understand what's motivating people's um, behaviors and decisions in these circumstances to be able to try to resolve some of the conflicts that arise. <clears throat> And I'm not the only person who has been interested in this topic. And I think, you know, the pandemic um, led to a lot of similar um, challenges in different health settings. And so the Hastings Center actually published um, a, a case report in January that was very similar about a 45 year old woman who was admitted to hospital with COVID, came to the ICU of respiratory failure, and, uh, you know, was told that if she were to get intubated, had a good chance of making a full recovery, but without intubation would almost certainly die. And then um, the patient declined to consent to intubation um, and the team attributed this to her, um, her uh, disbelief in the medical facts that she could potentially die from her respiratory illness. And so the team consulted clinical ethics in the situation and the response from clinical ethics was, well, patients have a right to refuse any and all treatments, um, but before honoring a patient's decision to refuse treatment, it's important that healthcare providers assess decision-making capacity. And when the decision is particularly consequential, like life or death, the threshold for demonstrating capacity is commiserately high. And in this case, the clinical ethics team said, well, the patient's false beliefs about her disease mean that she's not able to demonstrate appreciation of the consequences of foregoing treatment. And so they recommended that the patient be deemed to lack capacity. Um, and in this case, the medical team identified a surrogate decision maker, the patient's daughter, who was ultimately able to convince her to accept treatment. Um, although in this case, the patient improved without needing to be intubated. And the case report um, kind of ended with these lingering ethical questions, many of which I'm not going to even attempt to answer today, but I think it's really important just to, to put them out there for consideration. Um, so for instance, for patients where we say, okay, they lack capacity, when should we provide treatments over their objections? Um, what do we do if mistaken beliefs are widespread? So for instance, during COVID, this, this definitely occurred and can a significant minority of the population be sort of en masse deemed to lack capacity? And, um, you know, how qualified are we as clinicians really to adjudicate the truth and validity of individuals' beliefs, particularly when you're operating in a complex sociopolitical um, dynamic where there may be a lot of mistrust um, of institutions or the healthcare system. And I think for me, the bigger um, question that I'm hoping to get at with this talk is like, what is the, what is the root issue that's underlying um, these decisional conflicts? And is it a problem of understanding where patients um, just don't understand the information that's being provided and so aren't able to make good decisions? Is it a question of beliefs where patients um, can understand the information but um, don't hold the same underlying beliefs about what it means? Um, is it a question of values? Um, where, um, again, uh, patients and physicians may agree on the facts, but they weigh, the, they weigh them differently. Or, um, as I hope to discuss today, is it a question of emotion? Are there situations where um, patients or families are so overwhelmed by emotion that they can't actually process the information in order to make a good decision? And what do we do in those situations? Um, I think for the interest of time, I'm gonna kind of skip over this, but I do just wanna acknowledge that we know that there are differences in understanding and that physicians and non-physicians do understand the language that we use in the medical context differently. And so that is a really important thing to consider. Um, and we also know that there are, you know, valid differences in beliefs that arise based on people's individual situated contexts and experiences. And I, I love this cartoon. It's by a palliative care physician 
named Nathan Gray. And I think he does a, a wonderful job capturing how two people can look at the same picture of someone in the ICU on life support and frame it very differently depending on their, um, their situated knowledge. Um, so again, I'm gonna focus on emotion in this talk. And I think before we talk about how emotion might impact capacity, it's important to understand a bit about what we know from behavioral science and psychology about the role that emotion plays in decision-making. And I'm gonna use both these terms um, and the rest of my talk. So I thought I would briefly define them here. So affect is really the experience of feeling something, which is typically described along two axes, um, valence, uh, which is sort of uh, the positive or negative aspect of the feeling, and then arousal, which is how calm or agitated someone is. Um, and then emotion is a more sort of specific, temporary, physical, and mental state. And of course, you know, we describe many different emotional states. And there is robust literature that emotions do influence decision making. And that's um, both emotions that are integral to the decision itself, but also someone's background effective state when they're trying to make decisions. Um, and when we talk about effective states, we often talk about hot or cold states. So those that are emotionally charged are more calm and neutral. And you can actually get something called the hot, cold empathy gap um, that leads people to, um, to sort of errors in decision making. And so, for instance, if someone is feeling calm and composed when, for instance, they're putting together an advanced care plan in their family physician's office, they might um, make affective forecasting errors and have difficulty predicting how they're gonna feel about making decisions to withdraw life support in the ICU in an emotionally charged state in the future. Um, this empathy gap can also be interpersonal. And so as sort of maybe a calm, neutral physician who works in the ICU every day, when I'm meeting with a family who's trying to make a decision about something where they're in a very hot affective state, it may be very difficult for me to understand how they're thinking about the situation. We know that different emotions have different effects on decision-making. Um, negative emotions in general can lead to decisional avoidance or a preference for the status quo. Um, anger can decrease our perception of risk where fear can increase it, and that can influence decision-making. Um, happiness can lead people to make decisions with less information processing, whereas people who are sad tend to ruminate more um, when they're making decisions. And importantly, and we'll come back to this, high levels of anxiety and fear can impair information processing. Um, traditionally in cognitive science, um, the model for a long time was that of sort of humans as rational actors where we make decisions based on cost utility analysis. That was ultimately, um, uh, sort of debunked in favor of more complicated cognitive models, one of which is the dual process model that you might be familiar with from Thinking Fast and Slow and books like that. So that's the idea where there's two types of decision, cognitive decision making. There's system two, which is rational and analytical and what's done in sort of ideal conditions. And then system one, which is uh, what people do in time pressure situations, or situations where there's incomplete information. And in those situations, we rely on cognitive shortcuts or heuristics um, to help make decisions. Um, and now this can be really effective and helpful, but can also be prone to cognitive biases or errors. And um, we do know that when people are operating with strong emotions, um, they tend to default to system one thinking, and that can definitely make people vulnerable to cognitive biases. Um, but even more recently, there's been a recognition that emotions also provide useful information. And so um, increasingly, there's been this concept of effective rationality um, or um, uh, an emotion imbued choice model decision making. And um, I guess that's been described variably in a, um, as an affect heuristic theory. So that's the idea that um, our mind basically attaches emotional tags to various concepts in our head. And we use those emotional tags to help us rank choices and make decisions. 
And the somatic marker hypothesis is, is interesting. It's the idea that it's actually our physiologic response when we're considering options that helps us make decisions. So, you know, if your palm sweating, heart racing, the sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous system are, um, are helping us make decisions. And um, emotion can be really helpful in a number of different ways. So it directly provides information by answering the question, how do I feel about this choice or that choice? Um, and we know from experiments in the health setting that people often respond more effectively to risk information that's based in emotion. Um, so for instance, trying to make people feel afraid of getting skin cancer is more likely to lead them to use sunscreen than if you just try to give them sort of cold statistics around probabilities. Um, Emotion can be really helpful to compare a complex set of options um, by creating a common currency between them. So for instance, if you're trying to weigh, you know, quality of life versus life prolonging um, treatments, those are two very different ideas, but the emotions that you attach to each one can help you weigh them and compare them. Um, emotion also helps us direct our attention. So if you are presented with a number of choices and you have a stronger emotional response to one of them, you're more likely to seek out more information to make an informed decision related to that particular option. And in general, emotion can motivate behavior. So um, people often desire to make changes, choices that decrease uncertainty and kind of lead them to return to a state of emotional homeostasis. Um, the flip side of that is that um, immediate emotional responses can lead to poor decisions. And so there is this great experiment where um, uh, researchers had people imagine that they were diagnosed with cancer, and then they presented two options, watchful waiting, um, where there was no treatment provided and the risk of death was 5%, or surgery, which would cure the cancer, but it would lead to a lot of side effects like pain, and there was actually a higher chance of death overall um, due to the risk of the surgery. And in their study, half the people chose surgery despite the fact that overall um, the outcomes were um, worse with surgery. And so the conclusion from that study was that there's this strong emotional gut reaction to just get the cancer out that causes people to make decisions that are not rational in the traditional sense. Um, so what do we do to try to help people overcome that? In decision science, uh, they did another experiment where they basically gave people the same scenario that was on the last slide, and they asked them to make a decision after um, like a deliberate period of deliberation versus no deliberation. And what they found was that people who thought more about the decision before making it didn't make a better decision, but they were more confident in their decision. Um, and so I think this is a great illustration of a confirmation bias or um, this concept of motivated reasoning where people seek out um, facts and evidence that support a decision that they may have already made using emotional um, uh, heuristics. And so if you put that all together, I guess, coming away from this, how should people make important medical decisions? Should we rely on intuition or should we rely more on rational decision-making, knowing that there are pros and cons to both? Um, and I would say that the sort of summary of the literature as I understand it is that um, it's not wrong to use emotion to make important decisions. Strong immediate emotional responses can overshadow other important aspects of the decision, but using your intuition can help people integrate large amounts of complex information and develop well-informed gut feelings that can be surprisingly accurate. Um, and getting people to deliberate more about their decisions may not necessarily make uh, for better decisions. And so I guess that brings me to the ethical aspect of this talk or the question around, you know, we know that emotion does influence decision making, but are there times where emotion um, uh, impairs decisional decision making to the point where we can say that it impairs capacity, um, which is obviously, of course, a very serious claim to make since that involves um, taking away someone's autonomy to make decisions. Um, and then, you know, if so, what can we do in those situations? <laughs>
And so I thought before trying to tackle that, I would just do a brief review of um, how we currently define decision-making capacity in a medical context. And so um, the, I guess, most widely um, uh, cited criteria are those by Applebaum and, and Grizzo. And I think it's important to understand that these criteria were not developed um, a priori to try to sort of create the ideal model of capacity. Um, they developed these criteria by reviewing American case law and understanding how the legal system has treated capacity in the context of medical decisions. Um, and so they came up with four criteria, which is that people have to understand the relevant information, they have to be able to appreciate the nature and the consequences of the decision they're making, um, which I will just say is interpreted differently by different people, whether that is a general appreciation versus an appreciation of how it applies to the individual themselves. They have to be able to reason or weigh the risks and benefits, and then they have to be able to communicate a decision. And Canada and the UK have very similar criteria that are also drawn from case law or common law. And of course, um, underlying the idea of decisional capacity um, are um, some Western philosophical concepts around weighing autonomy and respect for an individual's right to, to make choices and the concept of beneficence, um, which is our duty as um, the medical field to protect people who are vulnerable from making harmful choices. Um, and if you want to go back even farther than principalism um, and Beauchamp and Childress, um, you can talk about Kant, who um, argued that people are ends in themselves who have free moral will. Um, and also from a utilitarian perspective, John Stuart Mill and others, um, you know, share the same sentiment around the importance of choice. Uh, and for them, that's because people know best which choices will maximize their well-being. Um, there's no gold standard test for capacity. Capacity is um, based on a clinical assessment. Um, but unfortunately, unstructured clinical assessments are notoriously inaccurate, and there's poor inter-reader reliability. And so... Um, there's been the development of a number of structured tools to try to help people more objectively assess capacity. And these tools rely on features that can be operationalized. And so primarily the four that um, were listed on that initial slide. And I think it's important um, just to really highlight that all these tools measure the cognitive aspects of decision-making capacity, um, and they all evaluate process and not the content of someone or the quality of someone's decisions. But I think um, one of the things that, you know, clinicians who are trying to do this at the bedside often find is that people can meet all four criteria that are listed and test in these, uh, tested in um, uh, these structured capacity assessments, but there can still be an uncomfortable feeling that maybe the patient is not um, making decisions um, is, is not capable of making decisions for some other reason. And so, um, you know, I think this is where the idea of emotion and values and how that plays into decision-making capacity becomes relevant. And so um, some medical ethicists have argued that determining capacity inherently involves a normative judgment. And so not only are we looking at, do people have the cognitive abilities to process information um, but also are they using the information in the way that they ought to in a normative sense? And um, Natalie Banner is a medical ethicist who's argued that this can be evaluated along three lines, um, epistemic, evaluative, and effective. And so um, epistemic relates to people's beliefs. Um, and so for instance, um, uh, to use an example of someone who's trying to make a decision about cancer treatment, um, if you have uh, someone who doesn't believe that uh, cancer, that their cancer is gonna be cured with surgery um, and they're making a decision based on that belief, is that valid? The difficulty with trying to evaluate the validity of beliefs, uh, well, there's several difficulties. One of them is that clinicians um, 
aren't able to know all the beliefs that a patient is using to make decisions most of the time. And also that it's very difficult to say that there's one gold standard of beliefs that we all have to adhere to because that sort of ultimately is in opposition to um, a pluralistic society that we want to live in. Um, and so I'm gonna put that aside for now. Um, but you can also look at values. So someone making decisions uh, using information in a way that's consistent with their values. So the COVID example of the woman who, um, or of the man that I gave um, who didn't want to be intubated, but did want to live and valued life, you could say maybe there's a values inconsistency there. And then the last um, uh, way you can evaluate this normatively is by looking at someone's emotional response. And here it's really the proportionality of the response. Um, and so she argues that people who um, are lacking in emotion altogether when they're making decisions, can they truly make informed decisions? Conversely, can people be so overwhelmed by emotion that they're not able to make um, uh, decisions um, and demonstrate capacity? And so a clinical example of this for me would be people in the uh, families in the ICU where we might be telling them some very difficult news about a loved one where the prognosis is poor and we're seeing absolutely no emotional response. I always worry in those situations that their ability to absorb and use that information is somehow impaired. And I'm not going to spend um, much time on this slide, but I just want to highlight this review article that has sort of um, very elegantly laid out a summary of the arguments within the medical ethics literature for the importance of acknowledging emotion and value in decision making capacity. And so I direct people to that paper if they'd like to read more about it. And so this brings me to the concept of concretized emotion. Um, and so Jody Halpern is a physician and medical ethicist from the University of California in Berkeley. And um, she's made an argument that, um, again, if we're evaluating um, someone's decision-making capacity um, based partly on their emotional response, that there are situations where people um, are so overwhelmed by fear and concretized emotion that they lack the ability to um, deliberate and, uh, and have capacity to make decisions. Um, and so in her paper, she uses the example of a, a patient, Miss D, who is an anxious but high functioning college professor who presented to hospital with falls um, and weight loss, ultimately consented to tests to look for cancer and was diagnosed of breast cancer that was metastatic. She was told it was treatable, um, but didn't really engage in the discussions around treatment and just sort of said to her medical team, I'll be fine. Um, she refused treatment. She was noted to be very highly anxious by the medical team. Um, she did participate in a psychiatric evaluation. And interestingly, a psychiatrist was unable to engage her in any direct conversation about her cancer. Ultimately, he concluded that she was anxious but he had no doubt that she was capable of making her own decisions. Um, she was discharged and uh, didn't present for any follow-up appointments or receive treatment and ultimately died about a year later without any continuity of care. Um, and so for Halpern, I think this was a case where she had serious concerns about the patient's capacity to make medical decisions and the conclusion that was um, arrived at by the medical team. Um, and this is where she develops this concept of concretized emotion, um, which is the idea that fear and anxiety can undermine people's ability to process information, reason, and deliberate to the point where it impairs their capacity for autonomy. And I, I just want to highlight that this is distinct from making poor judgments um, despite having the ability to exercise your intact capacity, people are allowed to make poor judgments um, and those judgments may be influenced by emotion. But what she's really talking about is a state where people are unable to process information and reason. Um, and so they've lost that capacity. And that's because those emotions dictate one's view of reality and prevent one from being able to consider alternate perspectives. And so if you can't consider the choices in front of you, 
then um, really that undermines the basic conditions required for deliberation. Importantly, this doesn't depend on the strength of the character of the emotion. Um, the distinguishing features of this concretized emotion um, are first, that it's unrelenting and consistent, and that people are unable to imagine that they could ever feel differently in, in the future. And so um, no matter what options are presented to people, it almost doesn't matter. They almost feel like there's no choice to be made because the future has already been determined. And usually this is associated with catastrophic thinking. And so it's, it's a negative feature that's envisioned. And the other key feature is that there's a systematic cognitive unresponsiveness to evidence. Um, and so people aren't able to even recognize that emotion is playing into their decision-making. And, um, and they sort of use rationalization and distortion to perpetuate their distorted views. <clears throat> Clinically, this concept really heavily overlaps with post-traumatic stress disorder. And, um, you know, I think it's been increasingly recognized that PTSD is common amongst people who have had life-threatening um, um, health instances or experiences. Um, and so, um, you know, I think that lends credibility to her hypothesis. Um, I think it's also important that this idea of concretized emotion is that these are highly focal, content-specific um, emotional blocks um, that impair people's capacity around specific decisions. Um, and so people retain their, their general cognitive functions and are often able to make rational decisions in other areas of their lives. Um, and importantly, unlike something like dementia, where people lose the cognitive ability um, to make decisions and have capacity, in these situations, the underlying cognitive capacities necessary for autonomy are still present. And so, um, you know, it be, it, then the burden is on us to determine how we can help people regain that capacity. Um, because I put magical thinking in the title of this talk, um, I wanted to touch very briefly on magical thinking, which I think um, may overlap in some ways conceptually of this idea of concretized emotion. Um, I will say that there's not a lot out there in the literature on magical thinking. There was less than I anticipated. Um, and so I think there's a lot of work that still needs to be done in this space. Very briefly, it's the idea that one's, um, or the certain, the definition is that there's a certainty that one's ideas and actions can influence the flow of events in the real world, or that people make attributions about causality that defy physical laws or culturally acceptable explanations. Um, what we do know about magical thinking is that it's used to combat helplessness or feelings of being at the mercy of the unpredictable. Um, not surprisingly, it's more common in stressful situations like situations of conflict or war. Um, it's linked psychologically to intolerance of uncertainty, emotional avoidance, and belief in conspiracy theories. And it's been connected to vaccine hesitancy during the pandemic. And I think for me, what's most interesting about the concept of magical thinking and how it may play into um, people's decision-making capacity in the medical setting is that there is some emerging evidence that it can coexist with complicated grief. And I think that brings me to Joan Didion's book. And I just wanted to do a shout out because um, this really gave me the idea for the title of this talk. And um, she does a wonderful job in this book capturing um, the distorted thinking that can arise with profound grief, um, describing her own experiences losing both her son, or sorry, her daughter and her husband in the same year. And so when we talk about this idea of grief or anticipated grief, um, I thought it was important to touch briefly on surrogate decision making and how emotion might impact decision making in the medical context for surrogate decision makers. Um, and that's because this is something that we see very commonly in the ICU. Um, you know, upwards of 90% of our patients don't have capacity to make their own decisions. And so we rely on family and friends to act as surrogate decision makers. And ideally, from an ethical perspective, surrogate decision makers 
should really operate according to a hierarchy where they first try to um, make decisions based on patients' prior known wishes, then based on this concept of substituted judgment or what they think a patient would have chosen for themselves if they'd been able to. And then if they're not able to determine either of those, then we try to make decisions according to the best interests of the patient. We do know that many surrogates struggle to meet these standards and particularly to engage in substituted judgment. Um, and that's even when they have knowledge of their loved one's advanced directives. And we also know that it, it's very um, emotionally distressing for surrogates to make these decisions, particularly around um, whether to withhold and withdraw life support. And there's high rates of anxiety, depression, and PTSD amongst surrogate decision makers. And many of them experience a lot of um, regret around their decisions, particularly if um, their loved ones have poor outcomes like death and disability. And so um, this was um, an essay in the American Journal of Bioethics where an ethicist at the University of Edinburgh sort of posed the question, um, does anticipatory grief in surrogate decision makers impact the decisions they're making or their ability to make um, uh, you know, substituted judgment decisions for their loved ones? Um, and so he argued that you know, surrogates are often caught between two ethical um, sort of standards, the idea of care and um, the need to make decisions um, and represent what their loved one would have wanted. And then the idea of attachment and that they um, uh, you know, um, are worried about threats to their attachment to their loved one, who's an important and integral part of their life. And that sometimes maybe surrogates make decisions that preferentially, pre preferentially um, favor attachment over care. So for instance, choosing to prolong mechanical ventilation, even when they know it's not what their loved one would have wanted. Um, interestingly, we do have some recent empirical evidence that anticipatory grief in surrogate decision makers does impair um, overall problem solving ability. Um, and so this was a study that was done in 2018 and surrogate decision makers had to solve essentially um, a problem solving questionnaire. And so, you know, I think it's important to acknowledge that this is general problem solving and, and not evaluating the decisions they were trying to make um, as surrogate decision makers. But I think this is a really important and sort of provocative study looking at um, a decision uh, capacity. And so interestingly, um, this question of whether distressed family members, you know, can, can end up in situations where they don't have decisional capacity to make surrogate decisions for their loved ones in the ICU was actually raised over 20 years ago um, by one of the leading researchers in, um, in sort of surrogate support in the ICU. And he did this study where it demonstrated that there were high rates of anxiety, depression, and PTSD, as I previously mentioned. And then wrote in his discussion that physicians are probably at risk of overestimating the extent to which family members subjected to severe stress are capable of making choices. When the outcome is uncertain, family members may develop coping strategies aimed at reducing their symptoms of anxiety. The fastest way to obtain relief from ambivalence and uncertainty may be to make an end of life decision, which might be considered as an ethical risk. Thus, physicians should direct careful attention to decision-making abilities of family members in stressful situations. You know, I think importantly, this is not to say that we take these decisions away from families, but rather that we need to be mindful of um, the emotions that are at play and to try to support people to make, um, you know, authentic um, uh, decisions according to their values. And in his paper, he provided some suggestions to try to help support families, including providing more information, allowing longer visiting hours, and encouraging family members to discuss and agree amongst themselves. And so putting it all together, um, I think, you know, for me, when you have these situations where um, patients and families 
are um, struggling to make decisions or there's conflict around the decisions that they're making, it's quite possible that um, underlying it all is some complex interplay of misunderstanding, fear, anxiety, um, beliefs or false beliefs and the sociopolitical context and sort of underlying val values at play. Um, and, uh, and so trying to tease out what could be going on can be very complicated. And I think it's important to acknowledge that complexity. Um, and so in the last um, four or five slides, I just wanted, you know, kind of say, okay, um, if we accept the premise that emotion impacts decision making and may even um, overwhelm people's capacity to make decisions, how can we then empower patients and families to overcome those emotional blocks and be able to um, um, act autonomously and make good decisions for themselves? And this I'm sure goes without saying, but I think it's important again, just to acknowledge that um, we do have an ethical obligation to patients to enable their mental freedom and capacity to make decisions that are true to their authentic selves. And that um, really part of that obligation is to engage in trust building and respectful persuasion um, and what Edmund Pellegrino, um, you know, one of my favorite bioethicists has called relational autonomy. And so the idea is not that we just wash our hands and say, you know, people are allowed to make poor choices, good riddance, but that we really try to wrestle with and understand where people are coming from so that we can um, make sure that they have what they need to make decisions. And so the first way I think we can do this is we can look at capacity um, uh, in a dimensional way. And so um, acknowledging that it's fluid and contextual, and we should always be reevaluating in the context of any decision, you know, um, how someone's capacity um, could be impaired along certain dimensions and not others. So for instance, someone may meet all the cognitive criteria and they may be making decisions according to their values, but they're overwhelmed by emotion. And so then we should target interventions to promote capacity in that situation um, and uh, to try to, again, help overcome that emotional block. The second thing we can do, I think, is use evidence-based communication strategies to really address emotion head on. Um, and this is something um, that a lot of communication um, tools are now incorporating. Um, and so this one is from the Vital Talk framework, which is based out of the United States. It's called nurse. And again, it's just sort of strategies for explicitly recognizing and responding to emotion with the idea that you can then diffuse it, um, help people process it, and then allow them to move beyond it to make decisions. I think the third thing we can do is focus on values, um, you know, because a patient's broader goals and values often predate their illness and so may be more stable in the face of strong emotion. So for instance, if someone's really struggling to make a decision in the ICU and you say, you know, what, what are your core values? And they say, spending time with family. Then I can say, okay, great. Let's focus on that and make decisions that help you achieve that. And um, again, this is another tool from Vital Talk that looks at um, how you can help elicit values and map out values of patients. I think the fourth thing that's underutilized in um, particularly acute care medicine is brief psychological interventions. And so, you know, as I mentioned, when I was talking about concretized emotion, these patients retain their, their cognitive capacity um, to make decisions. Um, and they can respond to, to fear-reducing interventions like medicine, psychotherapy, and social supports. Um, of course, we face a lot of barriers to doing this. Um, you know, people are often trying to make decisions under time pressure situations in acute care. Um, and so it can be hard to integrate a psychological um, intervention. Um, there's a lack of expertise in this space um, in healthcare organizations and often a lack of funding to support them. But this is one example of a brief psychological intervention that's been um, recently trialed uh, for surrogate decision makers in the ICU. Um, and this is developed by two clinical psychologists um, in uh, New York. And essentially, it's a series of modules 
that are delivered in the ICU, followed by um, two calls to kind of go over coping skills. And they found that this intervention did reduce psychosocial distress. Um, now, it wasn't evaluated specifically to look at decision making. So I think that, you know, it's, it would be interesting to, to see that work done. And then lastly, um, I really think there's a role to integrate this concept of narrative ethics and to help people um, tell stories and, and uh, craft stories around their experiences to help make sense of them. Um, and that, again, this might be a way for people to process um, what they're going through and to be able to diffuse emotion and be able to make decisions um, in alignment with their values and, in, and their intuition. And um, this is another study um, of a storytelling intervention that was done for bereaved surrogates um, of patients who had passed away in the ICU. And it was a small trial, it was a pilot trial. But they did demonstrate that, again, there was a reduction um, in grief and psychological distress. Um, so could we move these interventions upstream to um, the acute care space to try to help people make better decisions? Um, and so in conclusion, um, I hope I convinced you that emotions play an important role in decision making. Um, and that fear and anxiety may, in some cases, undermine decision-making capacity, and that clinicians have an ethical obligation to promote capacity, which includes addressing emotion explicitly. Um, and that when concerns around decision-making arise, it's really important to ask if the underlying issue relates to beliefs, emotions, values, or some combination of all three. Um, and again, I just want to stress that you know, I didn't touch in this talk specifically on what you do when there are truly conflicting values and beliefs. And I think that that is, is super important. And I also think there's a lot still to explore around how um, strong emotion and concretized emotion might overlap with um, false beliefs and uh, conspiracy theories and some of the tensions that we've run into during COVID. Um, and so maybe that'll be a subject for another talk. Um, but overall, I think really the importance is just that we maintain humility and really focus on relationships and supporting people through these, you know, traumatic um, experiences. And with that, I will take questions.